All right, Yanni. Yanni, sorry. <laughs> right off the bat. Uh, welcome. I'm excited to dive in with you. Um, <clears throat> why don't we uh, kick it off with, uh, you run a really exciting company, Wire, sendwire.com. I'd love to hear, you've been working on this project now for almost nine years, eight years. Uh, when you first started it, was crypto in the picture or was it a money, like a remittances international transfer service or from day one, were you thinking crypto? And, and sort of how, how, did the, how did it come into being in, in the early days? Yeah, Mike, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been uh, in crypto for since 2011, 2012. Um, and I fell in love with the entire community early on, especially Bitcoin. I felt, you know, I stumbled upon Bitcoin.org. I was really big into like the forums and uh, doing a lot of different, uh, I would hate to call it shit posting, but like kind of like posting on the, all these like <laughs> on Reddit. And that's where a lot of the community lived back then. Um, I came to SF. I was moved for a project for, into San Francisco. I met my co-founder and we just instantly hit it off. Um, and we were doing a lot of different things in e-commerce, doing a lot of different things in kind of like the broader commerce space. And both of us were both into crypto. We loved uh, loved uh, Bitcoin specifically. And, you know, we thought it would be a really good idea to add Bitcoin as a payment method to buy anything on the Internet. We had this like really small bookmarklet that enabled people anywhere on the Internet to buy uh, Bitcoin, to buy in anything in their shopping cart with crypto. And this is the first time, 2012, 2013, that everyone's like, oh my God, I can buy stuff on Amazon using these things that are Bitcoin, right? And that just absolutely took off. So since day one that we started the company, you know, it's been always crypto focused and and um, and we've been very into the community since then. So er early on, the, the concept was, let's throw on the, the pay now button with crypto so you can pay. And I assume behind the scenes, you're probably taking you're, you're showing a receiving address and then you receive it and reconcile it uh how would you do that technically how would you reconcile a, a payment and know that it goes to that transfer oh my god it was that uh it, yeah good question uh it was so the business was called Snapcard, uh and a lot of people might know if you like go on reddit and search Snapcard uh back then you could find a lot of threads on this so what we did is we had a uh, an, a chrome extension that basically over, you know, laid over on top of like every single website and you would go to a shopping cart and you press snap card and it would grab everything that was in that shopping cart and put it into your snap card shopping cart. You press buy. We quite literally just showed you an invoice. You pay that invoice. And on the back end, literally we would, it, it looked like magic because everyone's like, oh my God, you know, you paid this invoice and things were just bought immediately. But what happened on the back end is we'd actually liquidate those, those items into fiat using like BitPay, I think it was a partner at that point. And we yeah. would take that fiat and use my personal credit card to go in and manually buy things on the internet. And that just completely blew up. The point where we had tons of people just manually going in and buying things for people and shipping it to their addresses. And that was like, the, it was like <laughs> oh, a shit. massive hit early on. Uh, so, it, you know, you, the, the theme and the, the story of Wire is really, you know, we tried a lot of different things, but we've been always passionate about like really helping people get in the space and find a lot of utility. That's been really core to my co-founder and I's like DNA. It's like, we, you know, we started companies before this and it's always like, how do we add a lot of utility and how do, in you see us kind of like pivoting to try to find good product market fit over these years into what we're doing today, but always with this theme around how do we add value to the ecosystem? It, you know, we've never been the company to raise a lot of round, like raise a lot of money on a white paper, raise a lot of money on like the dreams of like doing something massive. It's always been like, let's produce revenue, add value to this ecosystem and get this into billions of people. And that's a, that's a common yeah. thing here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny your story there uh, from 20, 2017, really 2018 to 2021, uh, my my co-founder and I started this uh, crypto exchange where you could go from gift cards into uh, Bitcoin and vice versa. So you can get a discounted gift card if you had Bitcoin, and then you could get Bitcoin if you had the gift card, which is a nice way for people to on-ramp into crypto, especially in other countries. Yeah. And uh, we were always struggling with, like, how can people get Bitcoin in the first place easily? Because a lot of people just didn't have easy access to an exchange. And we, I think we actually integrated with Wire, this is in 28, 2017, 2018, uh, with some, some feature you guys launched. It was like a direct credit card to, I think it was a credit card to crypto. Uh, you were one of the first ones to do that, which is a really exciting concept because everyone has a credit card, but not everyone wants to go through the 
process of signing up with an exchange and buying it and waiting it and transferring. Uh, is that now still a product that's successful, operational, the, the credit card to crypto? Yeah, 100%. So in, we've done a lot of things over the years. And in 2018, we kind of, my co-founder and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, hey, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of different things. We had about like 10 business lines, about 60 people in the company, uh, all of them wow. doing a lot of variations of like some businesses doing well, some businesses not doing well. We kind of looked at each other and we realized three things. One, we realized that, A, we're doing way too much, right? And it's like, you know, we had, it was a, a combination of just like where all our pivots over the years and what we've done was kind of leading us to um, kind of having a lot of different business lines. So the first realization was like, hey, we're doing a lot. The second realization is that we realized that a lot of developers, especially we're coming into this space, this was like 2018, like, so like the start of DeFi, Web3, Web and like lot, all, there was a massive influx of developers coming in. And all these developers were choosing Wire to rebuild their entire payment infrastructure stack, right? Because at that point, it was really quite hard to actually get payment processing, banking relationships, like figure out the regulatory infrastructure. And as a developer coming into space, like you need all that sort of stuff to actually launch a crypto business, right? You need to have these kind of connections into the fiat world. And a lot of these developers were just coming in, using our APIs and building, um, our, building their entire infrastructure on top of us. And the third thing we realized was that, hey, it's not going to be one or two Coinbase is really bringing the next billions and billions of people into space, but rather it's going to be a network of developers really bridging, uh, building amazing products, reaching out to their local use cases, local uh, communities, and getting billions of people into space. So when we made that realization, we, we decided to go all in. Like we went super all in and we made some really tough choices, deprecating all our remittance side of the business, like this OTC side of the business that we had. Uh, we had a, a virtual banking business that created like a banking accounts for Amazon resellers, like a lot of crazy stuff that we've done over the, mm. the ecosystem. And we, we went all in on providing tools for developers to on-ramp into their ecosystem. And that's like effectively what we do today. And that looks like two things. One is we have this product called Checkout, um, and that's exactly the product that you're talking about. We enable companies like MetaMask, and, you know, Ledger, and hundreds of other companies in the space to be able to take a credit card and convert it into fiat, uh, take, convert it into crypto, and deposit directly into an application. We take care of all of the heavy lifting on the liquidity, the compliance, regulatory infrastructure, um, the the fraud risk management. We take care of all the heavy lift of connecting, helping end users. Uh, connecting to a fiat world and deposit into a crypto world or this conduit. And then we have our API infrastructure, which is like the whole white label version of that, which we we, have, we enable a lot of use cases. But 100%, long story short, Mike, uh, yeah. 100%, we have that uh, credit card to fiat, uh, fiat to credit card feature still. Wow, I, I didn't realize you guys, had, you guys had gone through so many transitions and different focuses. To have 10 lines of business in your, you know, five years into it is, uh, yeah, it's a significant undertaking. And I understand how that goes is, you know, you brainstorm every once in a while and you're like, oh, well, we could build this feature for these people. These guys have this problem. And then you go and, you know, spend a couple of developers on that for a few months. It's going well and seems to be working sort of, but then it's like, well, it doesn't quite mesh into the singular North Star direction. Uh, I I'm curious to unpack that a little bit. So you, you said that it's unlikely that the future is everyone getting into crypto through a few exchanges like Kraken or Bitcoin or whatever. Uh, and that it's going to be instead of that, or maybe in addition to that, it's going to be developers building tools. W what do you see as developer tooling that allows people to get in and out of crypto to fiat um, in addition to the exchanges? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like you're already starting to realize that a little bit, right? It's becoming more democratic of the entry points of like where people actually go in to get into crypto. And I think that's a really positive thing, right? Where, where, where we could provide infrastructure for people to build these entry points into the applications. Um, then we'll have like a really robust like ecosystem where it can really flourish and get billions and billions of people in the space. We're all, uh, everyone uh, is all in in crypto, right? Like uh, I'm, I'm personally like, I want to see this to the end, uh, which is going to, probably be my death. But like, you know, I think that, you know, we need to have a very, um, 
there, there, we need to have a very democratic way where people actually enter, enter these points. So, um, and you're starting to see that already. Like you have hundreds of companies that are enabling kind of like this uh, on ramping into their application, whether it's through other fiat uh, crypto providers or they have infrastructure that enables them to do that. Or these companies are actually going out and partnering with companies like Wire or, or Paxos or Circle, whatever it might be, and going and building this infrastructure to actually enable these entry points. So I feel like that that needs to happen. It can't be centralized between one yeah. or two exchanges, which has has been for a very long time prior to 2018. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so behind the scenes, so let's let's actually just kind of set the the scope of the business. You've been working on it for about eight years. Um, I saw that there was somewhere you'd mentioned Wire has traded five billion in assets with five hundred applications, eighty seven employees, uh, raised. Uh, what have you guys raised? I, I don't have that yeah, number. I, I, yeah, we're, we're growing we're, fast. All those numbers are probably outdated as well. So we've traded well over ten billion. Yeah. Last year we did over five billion in in processing volume, and in in the company uh, we have close to one hundred twenty employees now, uh, and scaling up really really fast. And I think to date we've raised fifty five million dollars. So um, the, the the business definitely has progressed. Um, and I'll tell you what, just to back it up a little bit on on kind of like the um, the ecosystem and like we've done a lot, right? I think the biggest, and this is like kind of like a really interesting point where you, you see a lot of founders uh, get into this. You know, since day one, we found success. In 2012, when Mike and I were like, oh, hey, this bookmark is like a really cool utility and a lot of people can actually use this to buy anything using their crypto. Since that, we, we showed revenue on day one. And many companies do not do that, right? And the problem mm. with showing revenue at day one is that every future round that you ever do, uh, it will always be on the basis on like showing more revenue. So like we could never go into a round of like, hey, we have this new idea, let's raise on that. Or this is a new startup or that. So early on, you know, showing revenue is a really great thing, right? You want to create a business that uh, uh, can sustain itself and it is not all vaporware. And, and uh, we see, we've, I've seen a lot of that in definitely 2017 ICO days and I'm sure you have to, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it, the problem with the showing revenue is you have to keep posting revenue. So our focus has always been like, well, where can you find most utility? And during bear markets and bull markets, we had to get really creative, right? Like, hey, you know, uh, this widget doesn't really make sense on, on on like the Bitcoin payment processing that we were doing in 2012 to 2014. When in bear market, nobody wants to spend their Bitcoin. So we pivoted into building wallet infrastructure. And the wallet, it's like, let's get more people into the crypto ecosystem. And we built this incredible wallet. We're the third largest wallet in the US at that point. And we started releasing APIs on top of that, started releasing different geographies. And then boom, 2016 happens, another bear market happens. And we realized that you know, people are using our wallets to actually do money transfer on top of them. So as we release different geographies, they're using our wallet to actually onboard U.S. dollars, convert into crypto, change the crypto into another geography, uh, exchange that crypto into the local currency and instantly have a new money transfer rails built on top of wire. So we, at that point, we like went all in. We were like, hey, this money transfer built on top of crypto is a completely new thing. And we really want to go all in on this. And, you know, money transfer is massive. It's never, you know, this is a huge utility for crypto in itself. And we've already built out these like local rails where it could be the exit points. Um, I, I think I see mm -hmm. Strike doing a really good job in actually building this. As Salvador, um, uh, they're, they're, they're having an extremely awesome use case with like us and the salvador and they're they're doing incredible work on that sort of front but we realized that in 2016 and we actually rebranded our company from snapcard to wire because of the international wires and that's where the origin came from and from there you know we we grew that out and kept growing and we came to that realization in 2018 uh where we have to go all in on this like sort of infrastructure all the apis and that's the story of like just kind of uh, following where revenue goes while trying to add utility. That's been the story. And that's why we ended up with so many businesses. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's definitely, it's been a journey, but I feel like I'm so energized. I feel like we got 20 more years ago. Uh, and yeah, no, it, it, I'm, I'm getting the vibe that you, it feels like you've had, uh, like three espressos, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is awesome. Um, I, I want to, I still want to understand this a little bit more. So when, so say the, 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 the major foundational product of moving money, the wiring across countries, the remittances is as it's often called, uh, in the case of moving it into crypto. So USD into crypto, say Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin into like a, you know, 
Okay. Costa Rican, you know, yeah. And uh, that process is, do you have to have bank accounts in each of these countries to operate? This is kind of reminds me, I, th I think TransferWise operates this yeah. way. That was kind of their, just go, I don't know if they use crypto at all on the back end at all, but they just have bank accounts. And so they can, you know, they know that the, the transfer is going to go from US to Costa Rica, but it may take 10 days. And so they can credit the account early, knowing that they'll eventually receive the money, take the float on that. Yeah. Is that, with that being the kind of the underlying methodology, how, does crypto, what role does crypto play in that? It, uh, Mike, 100%, the, your, everything you just said, uh, traditional co uh, payment companies like TransferWise just lipstick on a pig type situation, right? They're literally just, <laughs> and, 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 pardon me, I, love, I have a massive respect for the, yeah. they're, they're just great branding. You know, they sit on top. Did you ever see that commercial? You ever see that commercial? They run through London naked, like the half. They're the incredible. Team. I think they're. I think they're in the underwear, but it was uh, lipstick on a pig. Might be the right explanation. Yeah, I mean, like what they do. I mean, they just buy a bunch of liquidity from Barclays, and they're able to actually slush funds around and have enough liquidity pools where it can help people with the last mile. Right. That's like they wholesale mm -hmm. buy uh, FX, and all they do is like have an incredible user experience because no one wants to go to Bank of America and press that FX button and and like. Uh, send in a wire, whatever they have to do, right, to do that. So it's it's a slightly better UX UI uh, than than what is currently out there, uh, which is like Wells Fargo. A hundred percent. We have to, you know, the 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 interesting thing about what we built is that uh, we you don't need a lot of capital to do this, right? Because the liquid, like in, in in business like TransferWise and many other money transfer businesses, you need in order for that to work really fast. Um, you need to have liquidity pools. So a lot of money in, in say the UK and a lot of money in the U S so that if somebody makes a transfer in the UK, you actually have a lot of money here in the U S to actually pay out immediately to people in the U S you're still, um, you're still, um, kind of bogged down by having all the, like the local rails. So the ACH network here in the U S and kind of the faster payments network in the UK. Like, so that, that doesn't change. Like the way that you pay people here in the U S is the same, no matter if you're going to be transferring the liquidity uh, from one place to another. The thing that makes it really different is that it can enable like a company like wire that doesn't have hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in liquidity in both countries to actually transfer that value in real time. So we can use the crypto net, like liquidity. So I can buy crypto mm -hmm. immediately, transfer that crypto over to the U S immediately and convert that immediately and withdraw out to the, the bank account and, and instantly pay out. So that whole cycle, it goes from like a five day cycle to actually go into a two day cycle, right? Which is like the really interesting thing without ha needing to have millions and millions of dollars in all these different places. So you can imagine um, in, in a lot of markets are illiquid, which the value of Bitcoin like for El Salvador is incredible because there's not much liquidity on the FX side. So if you need to change like uh, using these crypto markets could be very, very solid in actually helping bridge that gap for remittance. Um, and that's like the super power. And there's a company like you know, protocols like Stellar have like an incredible anchor network that they're mm -hmm. trying to build on top of. And, and there's other protocols like um, Ripple was very, very much so trying to tackle the same problem. Uh, it's all liquidity thing. Um, it's never it's never mm -hmm. been anything else. And liquidity specifically meaning the amount of cash or the amount of local currency you'd have in, in each of these countries. So that if someone is moving money from USD into some pesos, that you have enough liquidity on the peso side and the USD side to cash them out instantaneously. Because if you don't, right, then people, then you break the promise of instantaneous payouts. Uh, so liquidity just being able to handle scale is, is, uh, why is that a hard problem? Like when I think about it, it's, it's kind of a accounting modeling, you know, you just, you, I imagine you sort of statistically converge on some, you know, growth rate between countries and you can fairly well predict how big you're going to be in different countries over time. Is it access to the cash, like from a fundraising standpoint, or what is the challenge there for these companies? Yeah, uh, so in the traditional market, it's like, like the transfer wise, it's you get enough, you start in a few markets and you build enough scale where you can like request lines of credit with the banks. And that, that problem is not as significant. Like, uh, once you get to scale, it's really like, and for them, you know, 
there's a lot of people involved, like there's a lot of banks involved in different geographies um, that all we need to take a cut of this as well. So Barclays mm -hmm. might be dealing, you know, might be selling FX to Bank of America that transfers might be paying two FX rates on. And then in addition to that, taking the local payment rails fees and there's fees all across the ecosystem. So uh, when you think about not only, hey, can a startup actually start a remittance business? because they don't need to have these massive liquidity pools. Like, so a, a company like Wire can instantly start um, some kind of like US, do US dollars to peso um, a corridor uh, because we don't need liquid liquidity in pesos. Um, we can use the crypto markets. There's a lot of crypto markets that have that sort of liquidity that supports it. Um, but then also like there's not that there's not that many players involved in it. It's just wire and maybe two exchanges that have very, very small fees on actually making that transfer happen. So uh, not only is the liquidity mm. pool ma like enabling more innovation in that sort of space and crypto is like on the forefront on that, but like the amount of parties involved in that transaction significantly decrease. And that's that matters a lot more when you go to like other companies, like Ni other countries like Nigeria, where it might be actually hard to get liquidity there through the banking ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nigeria is a good example. So what are the major corridors nowadays? Is it uh, Nigeria? Like when you see, when you think of these, I'm picturing there's probably some graph that will show this, but you picture a map of, of the world and you have USD kind of going into different countries, other countries going into USD and every combination of countries. What are what are the uh, the less obvious ones? I'm, I'm picturing obvious ones would be USD to Canada to Mexico to maybe to to the UK. Uh, what are ones that you think are would be surprising? Uh, there's a lot of inflows to Philippines, like uh, the massive, like mm -hmm. the uh, a lot of inflows to India, um, a lot of inflows to China, a lot of inflows to um, Mexico, obviously. Uh, yeah, but, but there's there, there's like a there's really good graphs of inflows and outflows of that. But there's also interesting yeah. graphs from like outside of the U.S. Right, like uh, the funds going from China to Brazil to uh, help out with like kind of like commercial payments on infrastructure. There's uh, payments from going into like East Africa to actually help out with like the expatriate funds with migrant workers. There's a lot of really interesting use cases outside of the U.S. that um, are are massive supporters as well. Um, it's important to note that, you know, we, we did, we went deep into this whole like money transfer from like 2016 to 2018, but then we were like, you know, I was, I was mentioning earlier, like we're now a hundred percent providing infrastructure for companies to build incredible, um, um, kind of remittance apps on top of us. So all the learnings that we've had from, you know, building kind of a wallets business, building our money remittance business, going now getting regulated and building this like banking infrastructure all over the world. You know, we have, uh, tons of like. Uh, banking infrastructure that we built out, we now provide as a really nice API for people, you know, Mike, if you wanted to come in and build a remittance application or a crypto remittance or a Bitcoin payment processor, you can use our APIs to be fully compliant, uh, to have the security you need to actually build this application and to actually use our payment rails to actually send and receive money. So uh, we've taken all our yeah. learnings there um, and kind of like wrapped it up in a really nice API now. What are the hardest parts of doing doing what you've done? Is it is it do you have to go through and get money transfer licenses in every state or uh, some other certifications or licenses in other places? Like, what are the from a regulatory standpoint? What are the hard milestones that you've accomplished? Yeah, I mean, we have money transmission licenses here in the U.S. Uh, we have licenses in Europe. We have licenses in Australia, Hong Kong, and made some acquisitions to acquire more licenses. We're in MSB in, in Canada. That's definitely challenging, and it's just a lot. It's it, mm. you know, it's from when we started uh, this road to getting regulatory infrastructure. The, the 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 path changes a lot, right? In every country, you know, what's happening here with stable coins right now is like really hot of mind um, and and top of mind, and that can really reshape the way that stable coins are really broadcasted. In India, they just uh, had um, a 30% tax on if you're buying things with crypto. Uh, so that just got broadcasted, uh, I think th just Whoa. this week. So it's ever changing. And, um, you know, the hardest thing is just staying on top of it, right? And 
we have a really nice API where people can build applications, but it's like a duck on top of water. There's a lot of stuff happening underneath the water to yeah. just make sure that there's like, <laughs> yeah. those APIs are just running fine, right? And a regulatory infrastructure is something that we think about. Luckily, we just got the um, uh, Deb Renault, who's just joined us as our GC, and she's she's absolutely dynamite and has a lot of, um, you know, she, she was at Coinbase before that, but has a lot of experience in just like international uh, regulatory compliance and product compliance and uh, so we, we, we have like incredible compliance team run by Steven, uh, Chang and, um, we're, we're, we're just super stoked on the kind of yeah. the infrastructure we built there. It's a lot of work. And as a developer, like it, it's going to take you 24 months to get up to, up to par and just get into the starting line where you can start adding values. Right. It's like with wire, you can literally get our APIs and start get running within a week. Uh, if you want to launch a crypto application within a week, that's fully regulated. Um, we have incredible, you know, it's a matter of weeks to years. Yeah. 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 Now, when it comes to the, the licenses in payment apps, it's, it's so, it's so painful and expensive and laborious and vague as to how you even do it in the first place that it, it is one of these businesses where when you build it once and like you guys, you've built it to then, to then not flip it, but, but make your licenses and regulatory work, uh, a foundation for other companies to build on. It's uh, it's, you know, it's kind of a no brainer unless your company becomes so large that you then say, okay, we're going to spin this out and do it ourselves. But that's not, you know, you have to be a very large company to even think about moving off, you know, somebody like wire, I'm sure. Um, so India taxes 30% on crypto. Oh, yeah, I, that just is, saw that. I hadn't heard that. Uh, so obviously the government is trying to discourage people from using crypto. And then on the other end of the spectrum, El Salvador clearly encouraging people to use <laughs> Bitcoin. And President buying Bitcoin uh, you, with his phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's amazing that the differences. I, I I wonder what goes into a country's decision to to take a stand one way or the other. It feels somewhat the U.S. is leaning towards being more progressive, but I mean, not clearly not being, you know, hyper progressive on this. Um, what do you think goes into a, a, a governmental? politician, your president or leader of a exchange commission that would push them one way or the other? Like, why would India be anti El Salvador's pro other people? You know, what's what's Greece doing? How did these countries think about making these decisions? Yeah, I mean, it's all different, right? And a lot of it has to do with just kind of like the, the infrastructure that it started from. Like, if you take a country yeah. like El Salvador, it's almost a no brainer, right? Like they this was like, you know, um, they have the opportunity of really leapfrogging all of technology and being in the forefront of like kind of new financial, new found frontier, right? And as a country, you know, um, that is, is, is currency is crippling. They're using the U.S. dollar as, as mostly like a currency. There is a massive opportunity for them to really leapfrog and start taking remittances, accepting as a legal tender and really get in the forefront. There's other countries that are more threatened by that. Like, uh, I think India has gone yeah. back and forth and, and don't, don't quote me on like, um, on exactly like I, I'm not a prof I'm not an expert on what Indian uh, India like com regulatory infrastructure. <laughs> uh, we don't do uh, we, we're not currently operating India, but there's um, but it's a it's an incredible market. Like uh, there's a lot of incredible developers that are building some of the world world's best products that are coming out of India, and I would love to go in there. But it's just such such a complex beast to get into. Uh, tackling that is like under undertaken in itself. But with India, I mean they've flip flop a few different ways, and I think that. Uh, as a whole, I mean, like everyone's trying to do a couple things, right? One is they want to make sure that people are safe, right? Like the, these, a lot. I, I, I truly don't believe that a lot of this regulatory infrastructure that's coming out, even through the U.S., is ill-intended. Like, oh, this is like mm -hmm. going to take over the U.S. dollar, or we don't have an opportunity working with together with like stable coins or something like that. I really do think that pe like uh, re regulators are coming in from complaints because people have had you know massive uh, have had the rug pulled out under them. We've seen that time over time, um, and they want a, a infrastructure that keeps people safe, right? And 
and, and it's a hard balance. And how do you do that while yeah. it, like letting pe- uh, giving breathing space to people to in- innovate, right? And giving entrepreneurs the the freedom to innovate. And you don't want to do it too early. You don't want to do it too late. There needs to be a fine balance. I think that we're way too early here in the U.S. I think that there, especially what we're seeing here with like kind of like the um, interest bearing accounts and like the reward systems that a lot of, you know is it a security? Is it not a security? And a lot of like states coming in pretty hard on uh, companies like BlockFi and Celsius. I, I think that. Um, there needs to be some clarity there, but um, uh, I don't believe that they're coming at, in from a position that, um, you know, this is ill-intended and this is not innovative. Um, I honestly believe that, but I probably get dinged for, for saying that, but I do think that there's some good <laughs> intentions there uh, in providing that, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, cer- certainly. I, I think it'd be hard to disagree with that, uh, at least at least in principle, because these guys are sitting around the table and their, their job is effectively to, uh, you know, they, I, I really do believe that from what I've seen, these governmental bodies, they hate when people file complaints, when there's, you know, really upset people that are, that are like sending emails and, you know, saying, Hey, you have to do something. There's a real forcing function on that. And on the flip side, there, that there is the obvious, uh, goal to reduce the number of people who are m- m- maleficent. You know, they're directly trying to take people's money, the scammers, yeah. the hackers, the fraudsters. So I think that that is uh, difficult. You know, it's simple in principle, but it's difficult in practice to actually weed out the uh, people who are doing that because it's, it's difficult to tell when companies are small who's who's doing something the right way versus the wrong way <laughs> and if a government comes in and says well we know what the right way is this is how you have to do it then there's really no f- flexibility there there's no ability to kind of do it the wrong way a little bit i, I think the ideal my, this is my view personally but the ideal regulatory philosophy is bend but don't break <laughs> you know some people are going to have their accounts hacked some people are going to get stolen but and that's kind of like a, a necessary friction. It's almost like, by analogy, I think of evolution. Yeah. Like some, you know, some some bunny rabbits have to get eaten by by you know the fox in order for the bunnies to get smarter and faster. And it's not to say that w- we we want that. You know, it's not like a, it's not a desirable or undesirable. It's just a state of how things are. So I think we could we could completely lock things down and say strict regulations on everything. Everyone will be safe we will not have any growth. And I think that's the aspect of regulation that's underappreciated in a world that always is like safety number one. Well, what, what's, what are you sacrificing for that, that great safety? And it's like, ah, I don't know. I mean, this is from a founder's perspective, but. I I definitely agree with you. There is a lot of learn, like, People need to get a, there. There needs to be some education on like how to protect your own money, right? You, if you don't own your keys, you're 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 not owning your money, and that's like a massive realization that people are going through. You've had like companies like Visa and like other acquiring banks that and and you know that always are there to kind of protect your identity. But if we're moving to a world where your digital identity is really really critical, and people need to learn how to protect their identities, right? Like. Um, I mean, we're not going to, yeah, I think there's, there is a massive learning curve there. I have a lot of thoughts. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, Tell me, what are you uh, thinking? What, what, like, what, what comes to but mind? Then, but then at the, uh, the other side, it's like, you know, like trusting other companies like Worm, or, or like like uh, like all the hackings mm-hmm. and that, that are happening. Like, there needs to be some kind of level of uh, accountability on the sort of like protocols that you're trusting and uh, and using as uh, at the same time and and. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think, tell me if you'd agree with this, that, um, that, uh, effectively, I think an un, unrecognized or underappreciated aspect of what we view as stability or safety in the payments world in particular is a uh, brand reputation. So like when I look at wire, I think, okay, put aside the fact that you guys have gone through the government certifications, just the fact that you've raised money, you have a lot of people, you've been around a long time, you're doing this podcast, like I can see who the founders are, there's transparency of the team, uh, the, the website looks good, the documentation is good, there's good reviews. All those things together wrap into a, an element of safety. And yeah, sure, the government, you have certain 
regulations and certifications, licenses that you've gotten, but those aren't like the thing. If you got those, I mean, I could come to your yeah. site and if I come to your site and it's a shady team and they're small and they're like, oh, but we got this license. I'm still very much questioning that. And I, I think actually the younger generation is probably more, more at assessing a brand by all of the first things than the actual certifications and licenses of the government. I, I tend to think that that's an older demographic uh, view of safety, like the government's going to keep us safe. My, my dad, for instance, will say, um, you know, I put my money in, uh, in USAA. This is when I was graduating college. I had a USAA account and I had Fidelity and some other bank, but it wasn't FDIC insured. Oh. It wasn't insured by the federal government. And I think it was Venmo. I think Venmo was the thing we were talking about early on. And uh, he's like, oh, you know, you got to be careful, you know. And I was like, what? FDIC insured. So you're telling me that the Fed if the in the case of a complete depression, recession, that this company is going to steal my money and then the Federal Reserve is going to come in. It's difficult to think about that because there's not a mental model like the Great Depression that happened you know, a hundred years ago where literally people tried to get their money out of banks and couldn't do it. I mean, I mean, that's so, I mean, Bitcoin was, uh, you know, uh, kind of started out as a revolutionary movement against exactly what you're talking about. The, the multiplying effects yeah. of dollars that banks have, uh, and printing money out of thin air is like literally why Bitcoin exists. And I think that, um, a lot of, a lot of people that have joined the, the crypto community uh, are, are realizing that, right. It's like, Hey, this is like, what is fractional, banking, like all this sort of stuff. And, and I, I think that I, I'd like to think that more crypto people are aware. I think that there are a lot of new people that are joining and it's going to be even more people, right? That they have inroads, like say through NFTs, which are incredible. And it's an incredible um, use case for adoption. Like, I mean, like we were, we've been talking about tokenization of assets for years now. And it's crazy to think mm -hmm. that uh, art was a, going to be, or digital art in, was going to be the first thing to actually be the catalyst for, for this growth. But you know, there's a lot of people joining this ecosystem without that fundamental realization that, hey, I'm in this because I believe that, you know, I need to owe my money and I believe that this current financial system is rigged and that we, you know, we're, we're losing losing value on a yearly basis. And um, there's definitely going to be some education with that as well because the, people, the rug is going to be pulled there and uh, it'll be interesting to see who stays in and who doesn't after that. But, yeah. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, well, I guess NFT, I, I want to hear a little bit of your uh, description of what what went into the integration with uh, or partnership with Stellar and Settle. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, I interviewed uh, uh, Danielle, Danielle Dixon, the founder, of, yeah, the CEO of Stellar a couple months ago. Um, awesome, She's awesome business. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So what, what went on underneath the hood and, and what, what, why should people be excited about this? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, I've been following Seller since day one. I'd like literally, uh, like since they first launched, I think in 2016, they were the coolest brand that came out. I don't know if you got, if you remember yeah. with, like, the rocket that it came out with, it was like, yeah, it was, yeah, like, yeah. The, black site. Yeah. yeah. And we were like, holy smokes. And they were giving free XLM. And I remember <laughs> there was a whole day at Snapcard back then that we're just like, we're, this is a cool brand. Everyone's getting free tokens. Let's, let's go ham. And I, dude, it was, it was an awesome day. So I, but it, over like, and it was very close to the time period where we were going into money remittance and building our corridors out. And that's like, they came out of the gate. It's like, Hey, we're going to be reshaping the way that money moves uh, uh, across geographies, right? Across the planet, how people move money is like, we're going to be reshaping that. That's been core to uh, Stellar. So we've tried for many years to actually work with Stellar. Like in, in, it's like, it's a match made in heaven. Like they provide infrastructure very similar to kind of like how the SWIFT network works. And all the SWIFT, the only thing that the SWIFT network does is communicate between two parties, like the instructions of actually sending value, right? And that quite literally, you know, the Stellar protocol has different steps and, um, and within those, you can actually do the same thing on the blockchain and you can send uh, information to a, a remittant party the, where you need money to be sent out. So. Like what we've been doing in actually paying out different parties within internally within Wire. So like Wire owns a bank account here in the U.S. and we own a bank account in Australia. Like we can leverage a stellar network of using the protocol of actually working with their anchors to actually move money. It's really a match made in heaven. Um, so 
we finally got this uh, deal up and running. It, you know, it was like kind of like working together. It's like, oh, this really makes sense. And then like we got got focused, like built something else out. And then in 2020, uh, um, I took over as CEO and I made a really big point to like, hey, this is a really massive partnership. We, we want to go home with like, hey, how do we work with Stellar a lot more? And um, and they have an incredible ecosystem and anchors that we, we can leverage and we can add a lot of value. And we built that partnership. And um, since then, we've launched uh, Argentina, Brazil corridors uh, through Settle, which is an incredible value, uh, ecosystem through the kind of the uh, Stellar protocol. And we're going to be launching a lot more. There's a lot more anchors uh, of hard to reach areas that people are building incredible liquidity pools and incredible user bases. And we have the US user base here in the US that now Settle can leverage into. And then now we're going to be leveraging into Brazil and Argentina, a few other countries. So it, that's the value that Settle provides uh, in a long winded answer. But um, yeah. <laughs> Wait, can you give me a uh, like a follow the money example? So someone starts off with some currency, they move into another one, they end here. Like, what would be, how would this sort of tactically? Yeah, hundred percent. So we've uh, so we've integrated with like uh, the uh, like uh, uh, the the decks of Stellar. So there's liquidity being broadcasted mm -hmm. there. Uh, we move U.S. dollars into USDC Stellar. Right. So this is like mm -hmm. um, we we use all our payment methods: our cards, ACH, wires. Um, and like in, in the U.S. I'm giving a U.S. to like maybe Argentina example. Yeah. Um, so we, we take in the funds. Um, we then convert it to USDC instantly stellar, which is literally at zero cost. Um, and then we convert, we send that over to Settle and we instruct Settle where to send it through the uh, Stellar protocol. Stellar then Settle takes that instruction immediately and actually broadcasts out payment to where it needs to go by using that same DEX on their side that they've built out to. So, um, so, uh, so I would come, I would come to, uh, some site like, uh, I don't know, some, some website, tesla.com say, and I go and I use a credit card and Tesla is powered by the, not actually Tesla as an example, but they're, they're powered by wire. So I submit a credit card transaction, uh, that credit card transaction visa is hitting the wire API saying, Hey, Mike is going to buy this product from this merchant. And then wire responds, thumbs up. You guys will go and you'll send a message to Stellar through the Settle protocol. And you'll say, hey, we want to fund you. We want, so we're putting money in uh, to the Stellar. You're buying XLM and then you're sending it to, in this case, the, it's a merchant. So it'd be a B, B2C transaction. So it would go to the merchant's account, the merchant's Stellar account if they had one. And that way, and, I don't know if you have, mer if it's a merchant or if it would be, if C to C, a consumer to consumer makes more sense. Uh, but that way you would be getting paid in US dollars. You're purchasing seller through their network and you're sending money out into Stellar. So someone is swiping a card or punching it online. And then the, the destination address through seller is happening nearly instantaneously. There's no settlement time, right? Is that roughly how... Almost, almost. Mechanics. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take a live example. Uh, we work with a company called AirTM, a uh, really awesome company. Mm -hmm. They're doing incredible. Uh, they have an, uh, a wallet that enables people to actually uh, receive funds in their wallet and actually uh, send funds internationally uh, to Mexico and a few other corridors. Um, so they, they're, they're built on top of the wire API. And basically what we enable them to do now is to take U.S. dollars with, with, with through a credit card, um, you know, ACH wires converting to USDC Stellar, right? So that that's instantaneously that happens through our liquidity pool that we built with um, the Stellar ecosystem, like the, the Stellar DEX. Once there's USDC, somebody on the ARTM app can actually be like, hey, I want to send money to Argentina or somebody in Argentina. So the ARTM will hit our API and they'll be like, hey, I want a quote for US dollars to Argentina pesos. Uh, we'll give them a quote. Uh, we take that USDC Stellar, uh, s go to the exchange, the um, the Stellar Dex, and then actually exchange value with Settle. Settle then takes the Argentina pesos and instantly pays out using the local rails there. And that's all done instantaneously with like I think the 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 cost of that is less than three cents. So the exchange rate, the the exchange fee that you have um, of actually transferring on the Stellar Dex is zero, and the Exchange fees, USDC on top of Ethereum to send that, it's like $23 or uh, 40 some dollars, like mm -hmm. depending on the time. 
but you being able to use that as a medium of exchange, it's like less than two cents. So it's incredibly fast and it's incredibly cheap to actually do this money transfer value on top of that. So that's how it works. That's wild, huh? It's amazing. It's like, it, it sounds like it's a hundred times better than the alternative. What the alternative would be what MoneyGram or Western Union or something where I'm, I mean, if I literally money wanted to put building, money into- MoneyGram's building on top of Stellar now. Uh, they have a massive ah. pilot. They're going all in. Uh, so this is all public news as well. Uh, but they have like, they have a huge pilot with MoneyGram and this is, a, yeah, the alternative, it, it's a no brainer for them. Um, it's like as soon yeah. as the liquidity pools and they are being worked on, like uh, we're working with Settle. Settle has built an incredible liquidity pool down in Argentina, Brazil, and a few other quarters. And same with a lot of the different anchors. Um, and there is a, there's a huge, huge pilot going on right now with MoneyGram, but they're going all in this year on that um, on that relationship with Settle. Stellar. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Do you think of Stellar, you could take Stellar as like a categorical uh, protocol, but do you think of them as a investment? Because when people hear this, I, I'm sure and I think, okay, if MoneyGram is going all in on Stellar, if, if you're saying Stellar really is unique, you know, presumably you surveyed the market, and you're like, Stellar really has something compelling and unique. Uh, do you think of Stellar as a transactional currency? where the price is not necessarily correlated to the number of transactions in the ecosystem, as opposed to say Bitcoin, I think of as more of a store of value where it's, it's really a speculative investment that people want to buy, hold, accumulate for the purposes of an investment is, I, I'm not sure if this makes sense, but do yeah. you see, how do you sort of survey the landscape of crypto and think, okay, this is a potential investment. This is not, this is not your individual advice or your strategy or advice, but just kind of broadly speaking. Yeah, definitely not giving investment advice. Um, um, but there's like, uh, I think that when you look at the, the ecosystem that Stellar's built, like all the anchors, they call them, uh, you can go on their website and see everyone that's working on that and providing liquidity. They're all typically like money transfer or kind of like uh, these sort of like uh, wallets that are in like really hard to reach areas, like uh, where money, it's really hard to get money into like Zimbabwe and like really interesting areas. And they've done an incredible job in building like actual companies that are producing value for their local economies and like in local um, jurisdictions. And that's the stellar ecosystem. So by default, like the, the move, the, the mission is really relative to actually money movement, right? It's like extremely relevant. I think that there are other protocols that could do a really great job at that as well. Um, I think Lightning Network would be a really fantastic thing to do as well. Like, uh, but there's there, you know, USDC built on top of Stellar is an incredible asset where you can instantly move U.S. dollars, effectively yeah. U.S. dollars across borders, and and have that converted at a fraction of the cost that anything will pay. It, it would cost you. So, um, yeah, it's very much more of a transactional. And the the I I derive value in the in kind of that protocol because they've of of the incredible ecosystem that they built. Uh, Wire being a company that works with Stellar, like we're a U.S. anchor here in the U.S. So if you'd like to use our APIs and like uh, be it, we're a good service provider to Stellar to build on top of Stellar, like we have really nice APIs to do that. But you know they have many many other incredible companies built on top. Settle being one of them, Talam, yeah. um, and, and many yeah. more. Yeah, no, I dig it. I, I love that. I love those guys and that that project. Um, I'm so curious to ask you this: if you if you if you aren't working at Wire, say uh, hypothetically, given all the products that you've launched and things that you've seen, are there a few ideas, uh, startup ideas, or problems that you've seen that you feel like are, are screaming out to the world, but no one is sufficiently investing time into solving them? <laughs> yeah, that's such an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I can't see myself not working at Wire. Like I, I like. Uh, you know, it's been a long <laughs> journey and I, I just like, I, you know, at, at this point in my life where I am and it's like the, the, the ecosystem where crypto is gone, I can't imagine anybody working outside of crypto. Like if, when somebody's like, oh yeah, like, and I'm no offense <laughs> to any other industry, I'm sure, I'm sure it's really great, but it's like, dude, this speed of this ecosystem is extremely addicting. Like things move. If you miss, if you go on vacation for a week, which is like impossible to do in crypto, like you feel like you've missed three years in any other industry. It just moves at light year speed. So it kind of breeds a certain personality and you need to be in that sort of excellence to actually be in this ecosystem. And there's a lot of information. So you have to be curious about uh, information. We, we, we have like, 
kind of our culture and DNA. It's like, you know, we, you, we have hungry people that need to learn that, that love learning, right? Like it's a learning culture is very much synonymous with people that are in crypto, uh, whether, whether you're like a Bitcoin maximalist, what Ethereum maximalist, whatever it is, it's, that's the same thing that we all share. Like we love learning. Um, so I can't imagine myself being outside of this ecosystem, but like we being it, like working with a lot of legacy payment systems, it's like any, any door you open up is like, what the hell is going on here? Like there is in, in starting from credit, like uh, how credit is actually broadcast to the people underwriting yeah. credit is, is very insane. Uh, and, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you could do with building reputation on chain and enabling that data to be broadcast to the different providers that can provide you liquidity. I think that's a very underserved ecosystem that, um, do you, do you, do you see any projects in that space that are significant? Um, not in the way, no, not that I take an approach of building, uh, reputation on chain. Um, that's like the, mm -hmm. you know, there's different people. Yeah. Not, 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 not in that sort of vein. It's like, who Who's the Equifax or whatever on chain uh, that that would be the basis of like creating you kind of like a credit score and I think that's a really interesting interesting concept and you know we've seen uh, you know savings like being able to earn seven to twelve percent interest on your uh, on your assets is a massive catalyst for getting more people in the ecosystem. They look at their current bank e account um, and they're like, oh my god, I'm like receiving point one percent interest from Bank of America, like, and then they start seeing like seven to 12% in the crypto ecosystem. I feel like that's a massive on ramp into crypto. But I think that also uh, borrowing is going to be a massive asset into crypto and effective bartering, the the, the rates could be uh, improved massively. There's, there's tons of companies that you, you know, mm -hmm. even maker, I guess you can um, draw down against the Ethereum and do some interesting stuff there. But mm -hmm. um, no one with a sense of a reputation that that'd be definitely an interesting uh, yeah. place to play in for sure. It, it, everyone needs yeah. money and everyone borrows and lends money. It's a, it's a part of our, uh, a healthy financial ecosystem. Yeah. It, it does feel like there's a screaming need given the uh, massive data breach that happened a few years ago <laughs> with, I think Equifax and TransUnion, one of the three and, and given how they're just an oligopoly that's just, tied up in the government, it, it feels like such a crusty old way of establishing credit, uh, n not accurate. You know, it has so many holes and so many, like, uh, just quick aside on this, my wife, uh, she's a doctor and she has, uh, per, per, she's paid off every credit card on time, paid every rent payment on time, but we bought a car and we tried to get a car loan and we had a difficult time getting her a loan from b the bank because she didn't have three, she didn't have a history of three lines of credit on her credit score. Oh. So because, because she didn't take out debt, she was penalized effectively because they need to have debt previously to show that you've paid off these things over time. And, you know, there's very little aside from the actual data input that they have to consider whether this person is, you know, responsible enough to take out a loan. And, to your point, there, there's so much, I mean, there's a, it's kind of a spectrum, right? You, you, if you have a, a limit to the data you can co collect, then you're not going to slide into like 1984 where, you know, all of your data, all of your reputational data is, is on chain or in a database that someone can access. And there's this, there is a, I think a slippery slope or a path that we don't want to fully go yeah. down where like everything that you've ever done is inside one place. And so if you ever do make a mistake or you ever do anything wrong, then it's, it's in there to be used against yeah. you. So it's it, it kind of same, similar debate in medical health records, you oh, know, yeah. it's like, well, we, we sort of want a centralized health record because it's easy to use, but at the same time you don't, be, <laughs> uh, for various purposes. So I agree with you. Yeah. Mike, I think the biggest difference there is like, uh, who you enable to have access to it. It's like, you have, right. And it's like, yeah. like if you have the power of making those decisions, like right now we don't, right? Like, oh, just, just yeah. assume that everyone has your SSN. Everyone has a last, you know, with your phone yeah. number, anybody can get any personal details, uh, you know, on any person in, in, in the U S and assume that all your data is just public. Like we should just be living in a world that we are all hacked. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to, like, not in a world of fear, but like, that's just the, the reality like all our information is public to everyone. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the thing that uh, the 
blockchain technology and that can re can really enable is like just who has access to it right and at least controlling yeah. that sort of information that's that's what's really cool uh, you know about that that sort of ecosystem <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a good point because when when a bank or anybody runs a a credit report, like they're just pulling, you know, they're just saying, okay, we're just going to do this, and no as asked. long as you give us a ver verbal thumbs up, like they can just go and do that, and it hurts your credit score. Some mysteriously vague black box algorithm that you don't really even know what it is, and uh, yeah, and there's no control over that. I've it's funny this this credit issue has come up in conversations in the past, so. For anybody listening, this is, feels like a real, so, a real problem to solve. Um, I want to also ask you about NFTs. So NFTs are popular. Yeah. A lot of people have heard the phrase non-fungible token. They know that there's a lot of people on Twitter with monkey profile pictures and that artists are now putting art, either digital art or real art, uh, pictures of real art on chain and that those are representative of the pieces themselves, particularly if it's physical, it's, it's representative of the painting on the wall. Um, there, there's this, I think that the last cycle that we've, we've gone through up until now, it's February 3rd, 2022, has been uh, really kind of a, like everyone's very excited. Mm -hmm. And so they're buying and buying and buying. And then when people purchase NFTs for the purpose of making money, you just call it art. If people are buying digital art for the purpose of making money, there always has to be somebody after you that values that more than what you paid for it. And that is when you're, you know, you get into this bubble effect where we're the only ones here. There's no one else that's going to come and buy this monkey uh, JPEG for 15,000. And, and then it, you know, prices decline when, when things reemerge, when there's real value creation on NFTs, what do you think this, uh, looks like structurally when, when we, we look back and say, wow, this, this really was, uh, highly productive and, and useful. Yeah. Um, and I uh, caution this, like, cause I, I am a massive believer in NFTs and, and, uh, uh, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, like, uh, it, this, it, it, you know, just speaking truthfully, this looks when things start being crazy, they probably are crazy. Like when they start feeling <laughs> crazy, like, you know, and people were spending millions and millions of dollars for, you know, an, uh, an NFT is just like, is that where we're heading right now? Is that like, is that, is that it? And this smells very familiar to the ICO boom that I've been through and you, like you've been through it as well uh, in 2017. It just, it has that same type of smell. Yeah. When things are crazy, it probably is crazy, right? And people are going to get hurt. Uh, but guess what? They're happy. Like after the ICO boom, we had incredible companies be formed, right? Uh, and a lot of the companies that were formed after the ICO boom are so relevant companies with tokens, and they're they're actively adding value to the ecosystem. And unfortunately, you're, I, I have a h strong hunch that you know it's going to happen. The same thing is going to happen here with NFTs, right? The the amazing thing is that you're going to have a lot of people that are going to gain long term conviction on in, in crypto so you have like like we saw that in I, I, ico days it's like hey well shit i'm holding all these bags right now like might as well just wait it out right and the amount of people who coming into the ecosystem were vastly larger they became engaged and those people right now it's so fascinating because like a lot of those people that have been holding bags from 2017 and 2018 are actually applying to be in crypto today like they they you know mm. there there's a massive influx of people that got into that era that are applying for jobs at Wire and many other companies in, in the crypto ecosystem. So net positive, it's like, hey, we're gonna have a massive amount of people coming into the space. A lot of people are probably gonna get hurt and they're probably gonna be holding on NFTs, but there's probably gonna be another boom. Um, and there's probably gonna be incredible companies that are formed out of this influx of like, in, you know, amazing, uh, uh, amazing NFTs are being broadcasted today. With that being said, what the future will look like, I, I really do think that there's a world where NFTs uh, add a lot of value to many places. Uh, digital rights management, like being able, artists having direct mm -hmm. uh, correlation to the rights that they actually, like the the songs that they actually sell. Catalog is doing an incredible job and in, in letting comp like artists really, uh, f you know, float their, their songs out there and, and sell rights. And um, I think that and there's a really strong incentive um, payment incentives back to artists and music. And I think the same thing's happening with NFTs and I think they'll continue. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's ripe for innovation. It, that industry has been 
stagnant for many, many years, right? Um, there's other things I've been innovated, like kind of like on the on on the on the the technology side, but like this is like the payment side of like the industry hasn't changed for for thirty to forty years, and I think it's right for innovation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. I, I think the uh, how I sort of parse out where like separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, is that if the art that you're buying, if, if you're not if you're not purchasing it for any sort of aesthetic appeal or value yeah. for yourself, you know, if I'm if I'm just there is a this is where I find it difficult. So there's a lot of people who will buy traditional paintings and put them in a basement of a museum, never look at them purely for the investment, you know, or the accumulation of wealth storage. And then sell them one day, and that might be a good investment decision. Uh, in the case of NFTs, you you can't. There, I find because it's so easy to copy and paste, whereas it's so difficult to take an actual physical painting and you know, reproduce it in my living room. It's. Uh, I don't know. I, I I find it difficult to to say. Okay, this person owns this JPEG, this painting, this art piece. Uh, or the, you know, this digital art piece, what value does he receive or she by owning it versus, versus not owning it and just putting it in my, you know, my Twitter profile or desktop. Is that, uh, is that, do you think that the fact that I'm even questioning that and I don't hear other people questioning that, is that potentially an oversight that many people are, um, you know, there's an oversight broadly speaking and people are just kind of ignoring it, ignoring it until one day we realize, Hey, there is not a big deal to owning this piece, this JPEG. It, what does that mean to own it? You know, practically speaking, I, does, does that seem right to you? Yeah. I mean, like that argument, I, I think it's made a lot, right? Like where people are copying yeah, okay. and pasting and uh, the JPEGs. Yeah. And I think the, the at the end of the day, it's like you have to, there's a clear trace of like a clear ownership of something, of an asset. And as long as two people believe mm -hmm. that that asset is uh, valued at that and, and that, you know, there's a clear paper trail, which is a blockchain that provides like, you know, ownership uh, of that asset. I think it's a fair game. I just think that, you know, yeah. people are in it for, are, are definitely coming in, in it for the wrong reasons. And there's a lot of um, similar hype and hysteria happening in the, that I've seen in the ICO days. Right. And yeah, and I, I, I think, well, it's, it's, it, I, I, there's no, pro, you know, don't invest more than you can lose is like common common thing that everyone talks about, and I that 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 doesn't change really for NFTs as well. Um, you know, you got you got to put your money somewhere though, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> sitting in a U.S. dollar bank account just doesn't doesn't seem like the right move Dude, nowadays uh, with inflation and. But luckily, I mean, there's like incredible uh, protocol. I mean, like there's a there's like really you you know there's incredible protocols that you can stake your assets onto. There's incredible protocols that you can have you can limit your risk by insuring your assets. Uh, there you know there there's there's a lot of cool things out there um, that really are good store of values as well. Bitcoin's a really good store of value as well, um, if you're into mm -hmm. that. But you know, that's uh, personal thoughts aside, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows where it goes? I mean, it's just like predicting the future, effectively. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. It is. You know, as soon as as soon as I'm tempted to say, "Oh no, it's it's definitely Bitcoin. It's the first one. It's got you know this Jesus story with this guy <laughs> who doesn't exist in the real world. Like it's got to be. That's got to be what people believe. There's all these Bitcoin maximalists. And then I remember, oh wait, no, this is just this is just whatever we say it is. If people decide to stop being interested in Bitcoin and start being interested in the next thing, then all of a sudden it's not worth anything anymore. Uh, unlikely to be an absolute either way, mm -hmm. but it is a good exercise in sort of assessing value. It, it, I, I, I think this has often been said, but I, I really appreciate it. I think the rise in crypto, the growth of crypto companies, the overall consideration of the effects of the economy and the influence of money across different countries is something most people wouldn't normally think about. But when crypto comes into the picture, they, they start thinking, okay, what is a currency? What is its purpose? And I, I think that that's a super positive thing for people to consider, myself included, you know, trying to learn more about it. Yeah, 100%. Any, uh, any, other, any other projects you'd want to shout out or protocols you're particularly excited about? Um, I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, like, we're, we're definitely working a lot with Seller. Uh, I think they're doing incredible work mm. on that ecosystem. Um, and I have massive believers in, like, the infrastructure they built. Um, it's it's kind of like they've, they've taken all like the the themes of like what 
Ripple was doing and actually executed it against on a on instead of like a banking institution level, which is like what Ripple really went through, but on a, a more community based level, which is really really exciting. Obviously, Solana's mm -hmm. it, dude, it, it's getting a lot of traction, um, and it's 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 looking incredible. Like the projects and the momentum the developers building on Solana, we we obviously see it firsthand, right? So a lot of developers come to us and like, hey, we want to build different projects, and we can see like exactly where uh, they're they're choosing to build. Avalanche is incredible as well, uh, but mm -hmm. these it'd be interesting uh, when E two goes out to production and. Um, you know, what kind of world are we going to live in? Are we going to be in a multi-layer world, like layer, have a lot of L1s, or is it going to be a lot of, like, these L2s that people are going to be focused on? Like, when fees actually drop for the Ethereum network, are people going to be moving off? It'd be a very interesting uh, dynamic to see. I think that we'll live in some kind of multi-chain world uh, where we'll have, like, a few L1s that really succeed and have purpose, like, um, so, like, and you start seeing that, like, all these chains are just trying to, like, like Solana, I think, is really going for that payments infrastructure layer, being the really fast payments infrastructure. I think, um, like, Algorand's really going for, like, the securitization of assets and all the, the companies that we're working for, like, how do we tokenize assets and going for that. Obviously, they have overlapping um, similarities and, and stuff, yeah. but I think it, it'd be interesting to see how it, the cookie crumbles in the future. The one thing we know is that they all have deep pockets. Like, everyone, Solana, Avalanche, Algorand have deep pockets, and it's going to be... Uh, just as similar that we had the browser wars in early internet, right? Where MSN, like all these like browsers were having like mm -hmm. a deep uh, battle. We're going to, I think we're going to see the same cutthroat battle in, over the next years uh, with the protocols investing in, you know, Hey, we want to get Facebook or we want to get these large brands to come in and we're going to be paying lots of money for them to choose our protocol versus other protocols. And uh, I don't know if that's like a good thing, a good indication of like, what where value should be produced like just how deep your pockets are but i feel like that's the, the battle that we're gonna we're gonna have over the next couple of years and um it is what it is but um and i guess there, there could be healthy competition there but uh yeah yeah crypto battles hey it's an adventure right yeah um all right man thanks so much for hopping on today are you active on Social networks that you want to shout out, Twitter or Medium or anywhere else? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Yanni Generis is my at Yanni Generis is my Twitter handle, uh, and then SN Wire is our our company handle. And yeah, uh, super super. You could always reach out to me on that. Um, I keep my DMs open and uh, very open to having any conversation. You're the man. You, I, I like the way that you explain things very simplistically, uh, but at the same time, I can tell that you've been through. You've been through the gauntlet <laughs> enough to know exactly what you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks, Mike. Learned a lot. Thank awesome, you. man. Enjoy the day. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye.